is something that will be a familiar pattern to some of you at least. It's something I like to call the pattern of life. Now, does anyone vaguely recognise that? For those who have been around for a while, um, who came a couple of years ago, I showed you this. That's right. Very good. Thank you. Neil remembers. It's a challenge. You've got to go down to go up. That's right. And um, I have to say on... This is where... Uh, Tim's not here, but I went for a ride with Tim on, on the, on the, out in the bush the other day. And it's a different side of it. We, we realise when you, as you, the more you go down, you realise, yeah, you've got to go up still. Uh, <laughs> but that's a whole different thing. I just thought the down and the up thing... This is different. This is you have to go down to go up. Another way, way, another way of saying it is everything good costs something. If you want to put it that way. To give you a simple image, it's, the general principle is kind of like a bow and arrow. So if you just sit the arrow on the bow uh, with no tension, then obviously nothing's going to happen. Is it? It's just going to sit there. So how do you make something happen? Pull it back. So you pull it back against the string of the bow and even though it's in the wrong direction from where you want to go, you're loading energy into the arrow obviously and then that little bit of motion in the wrong direction sets it up for lots of motion in the right direction. Okay, So that's, try and think of that as perhaps one of the, the patterns that fits in with this. So like I said, this is, a, this is a principle of life and I'm going to repeat the examples I gave you last time because it was over two years ago now so you've probably all forgotten. So. Far from Neil, obviously. <laughs> He's got a. If you want him to remember something, get, you know, if you need to remember something, ask Neil. He'll help, obviously. But see if you remember any of these. But I think these are just as valid now as they were then. So you'll need the sacrifice of selflessness to achieve a better marriage. You sometimes need the sacrifice of war to achieve a better and long-lasting peace. Sometimes. You need the sacrifice of wisely investing your hard earned and putting that money in to get a return in the long run. And this is the one that also relates to our ride on Friday. You need to <laughs> the sacrifice of pain and exercise to get better fitness and help your general health. And it's probably also pain in diet as well sometimes. That also is part of it. But you got, it costs you something, doesn't it? You've got to, to get healthy. You need the sacrifice of putting yourself and your pride on the line sometimes to share the gospel with people so they can be saved. If everyone just kept to themselves, people wouldn't hear. You need to take a bit of a risk. And this one is a bit poignant as well. Um, you need to go through the agony of death to reach the joy of resurrection. And of course, I've put that last one there um, because it does fit nicely with our psalm today, Psalm 22. Because Psalm 22 is built around this exact pattern. I don't know if you picked that up as we went through, but so I try to get the pause in there. Um, the first part describes death and sacrifice, but the second part, the greater end that comes from that sacrifice. And that pattern is most clearly seen in, uh, in Jesus Christ, of course, you know, in his death and resurrection. And therefore, this psalm is considered one of the most powerfully messianic of them all. And messianic just means speaking of the Messiah, Jesus. So that's what, that's what this psalm is very strong in the, on that. But before we look at that today, I just want to set our sights a little bit further now concerning the psalm in, and its place in the Psalter. Psalter is just the word, the word for the book of Psalms. The Psalter, it's like a hymn book. Because this psalm is the first in what is sometimes called the shepherd psalms. You may not have heard that, but you'll be very familiar with that in a few weeks' time. So that's 22, 23, 24, they're the shepherd psalms. And it's kind of like how the previous two psalms, 20 and 21, were, were a pair, and they kind of talked about how the nation of Israel, the prayers for the nation of Israel going into and then coming out of a su successful battle. So the battle psalms, you call them there. So in the same way, these three shepherd psalms tend to fit together as well, describing the shepherd of Israel. Now, in the context of the day, who's the most obvious and tangible shepherd of Israel? David, the king, that's right. And with all these three being psalms of David, 
naturally he would be the king in mind for the, the average subject in the kingdom as they sing their psalms. He's the, the one they're thinking of. But as you will have noticed in the reading, it doesn't take long to see that much of what was written um, certainly applies very strongly to Jesus from our New Testament perspective. It may, a lot of it may apply to David, but I don't think all of it would. I don't know how often he was pierced in the hands and feet, for instance. So when we come to the New Testament and see how this, how does that give us the tools in the New Testament to be able to apply this to Jesus and get the full meaning behind what these shepherd psalms are, are trying to tell us. And if we get those tools and apply them, it begins to take some shape. But rather than get too bogged down in, the, of the, in that before, before we go through it all, we'll save much of the overview for um, when the message at the, uh, in three weeks' time when we go through the whole thing as a group. Okay, so I'll have one whole message just for that. So I'll save a lot of that for that, uh, for that time. So it'll be the overview message. So let's, uh, this is going to be great to see that overview message. It brings it all together. It's really, I'm looking forward to that. So how is this psalm titled then? Back to Psalm 22 specifically. It says, To the choir master, according to the door of the dawn, a psalm of David. Okay, so the question everyone seems to ask is, what does it mean that it's according to the door of the dawn? Well, no one really knows is the correct answer to that question. Although it's likely that it refers to some tune or style of music, perhaps, um, which of course is long lost to us today. But I want to draw something out of the words there because it's in the meaning, remember, not the music, but it's in the meaning that the Spirit speaks to us, in, certainly in the Bible, because that's what we, all we have. I just want to draw something out from the words there because it's uh, something we've sort of... Actually, we haven't talked about this before, but I'm just going to bring this idea about the doe and the deer. Makes me think of Do Re Me, the song, doesn't it? Do a deer. But it's fairly obvious with the picture up there what, what we're going to talk about. So you can see there's a fawn with her there. The, the doe is obviously the big one. And the fawn is the child or the baby. And what I want to do is highlight something about what a deer is like. When you look through all times, the, the, a deer is mentioned in the Bible... Um, you just you look and put them all together. You can see it has a bit of a typical characteristics of the deer. Um, it uses those things, and it's the idea that they're gentle and quiet and loving. It's the idea of, idea of a deer. So that's kind of why I picked that image there, because it kind of ca- captures those things. But there is something else deer are known for as well, and that's uh, they're very good on their feet or their hooves. <laughs> You know, even on rocks and dangerous ground, they don't lose their grip. You know, the feet of a deer, you know, is they can pick their way through difficulties pretty well. And so as we head into this psalm, you can see those characteristics coming through. If you've thought about, I don't know if you've thought about that, but the gentleness and caring nature, as well as the, um, the good feet. Because uh, if, let's face it, this psalm is ultimately about Jesus and his first coming. We'll just say that's the, it's a messias, messianic psalm especially in terms of his death on the cross and resurrection. And for the Son of God to die, that is the ultimate in gentle and quiet and loving, right? Especially someone as powerful as Jesus is. This really highlights his gentleness. His next coming is a whole different thing, but that's, yeah, this first is very much a humble appearance. And the cross and all the taunts we read about in the psalm, they're, they're pretty treacherous grounds to navigate because as we read through the psalm, all the things are happening to him. And he doesn't slip, does he? So there's the other side of the deer. So anyway, that's just something about deer that might help explain why they've used that, you know, that word there in, in, the, in the title. So we're going to look at the first section of the psalm here, and it goes, the first section, not, the, not the, of the two main sections, but there are several subsections. So we'll just look at first chunk was verses 1 to 5, which describes abandonment by God. And so as we, as we set out, we'll get to these famous words. This is the words that Jesus cries from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? So I don't believe Jesus used those words just because they captured how he was feeling. He didn't just, where's a bit of the Bible that describes how I'm feeling and say that? 
though they certainly did, of course. But why had God forsaken him? Every other time, Jesus always refers to God as what? Father, that's right. Every other time in the Bible, he calls him Father. This is the one time in the Bible that Jesus didn't call him Father. But this is the time he couldn't call him Father because, well, Paul tells us why, and I'll, I'll go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. You don't have to follow I'll just bring that up for you. It's because for our sake, or in our place, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So it was the innocent in place of the guilty. So the accepted son in the place of the rejected children because of sin. And so because he was in our shoes, you could say, taking our place and our sin on the cross, God had to turn his back on him, had to reject him. And so he took these words of Psalm 22 and he cried out to God. But as I said, was it just because of his suffering and they happened to capture his feelings well? No, I don't think so, because when both Matthew and Mark quote Jesus saying this verse, they provide a translation. So when you look there, I won't go there now, but when you look there, they both provide the translation in the Aramaic or the Hebrew. And perhaps part of the reason for this is that they're recognising that Jesus is pointing pointing us, as the readers, to this ancient text. Even in Jesus' day, it was ancient. It was like a thousand years old, Psalm 22. So I believe in saying these words, Jesus is pointing those who are paying attention to this psalm, saying, you know, um, and not just verse 1, he's not just saying this is verse 1, but the whole thing. Because it was common in that day to just, you know, to quote the first line of something and use it to represent the whole. Or even how the first word of a book was often used as a title for the, for the book. Sometimes the Bible books are that way as well. So I would argue that Jesus is saying, what he's saying by quoting this is, hey, you want to know what's really going on here? Go and look at Psalm 22. That's, that's what he's saying. And in writing these words first, David may well have been describing some own pain in his life. I'm sure there was certainly situations which brought this about. And he's expressed similar thoughts in earlier Psalms about the pain he's going through. But as I mentioned before, soon enough we see that the greater application is certainly to Jesus. So I think the explanation is that as a prophet, David, some difficult time in his life had caused him to pen some words about it, but soon the Holy Spirit caused him to see ahead and describe something far greater. So we read on verse 2. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Now this is something not just David experienced and not just Jesus experienced, but many of us experience, don't we? This kind of thing, we're crying day and night. You know, there's times in life when your prayers seem to hit the wall or hit the ceiling and you're losing sleep and everything just seems wrong. Well, let's we'll try and bring some encouragement that's in that. It's in this, this here. Uh, firstly, you're not alone. Jesus was rejected by his father but that's because he became sin for us. He was accepted again, remember? But God is still there when we're in this sort of thing. God is still there working in and through the pain in his great love, even though it can be hard to see at the time. And also, other people have felt pain like this for thousands of years. And that's not to minimise your and my hurt, but I find it a comfort to know that other people have been where I am you know, and got through and. I'll, even though I've heard you know, the song um, Everybody Hurts, I've heard people have, it's, it's a secular song, but people have, have gone away from, uh, they were going to kill themselves and they went away from that because just knowing that other people have gone through what I'm going through it can be a comfort. So, so if, if that's a secular song, how much more, you know, God's words. And other people have been through what you've gone through, they're sitting beside you in church today, you know. Well, that's why... That's what churches are about. A large part of it is people to help you in your difficulties. So let's talk it over if you need someone, and um, that's what a fellowship like this is for. And the second point is, don't forget the pain will end. Whether it's a your relationship breakdown or whatever it is, the news is always that for those in Jesus, the best is yet to come. And 
the pain will end usually in this life, yes, but not always, but usually. So in all these things, the goal is to keep looking up, whatever it is. Because you've got to go down to go up, don't you? Right? So keep looking up, That'll, you'll get there. And we keep our eyes up on God because we know who he is. He's dependable and faithful and won't allow evil to continue forever. And in verse 3 we're reminded, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. So yes, keep looking up, because our great God loves us and, and he loves us to keep praising him through all things. There's a fair part of the Bible, times in the Bible, where, you know, we're told to praise him through all things, and no matter what it is. And it's all to his glory, especially when it's hard. God is really glorified when you're having a hard time and you still praise him because it shows that you, you know, you're really serious and genuine. But next, David looks back, and you could argue there's a, sense, a little sense of complaint here, perhaps. But I think the reality is that he and Jesus are using the past goodnesses of God, as shown in the treatment of the Israelite patriarchs, you know, like Abraham and those guys. And he's asking for that deliverance for themselves too, or they are. So David and Jesus are kind of both praying this together, you could say. So, you know, the deliverance that they got, can I have it, please? Because he's the same God, right? So verses 4 and 5. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So it's kind of, Lord, please help me the way you've always done for your people. You know, just asking God to keep doing that and be, be who he is. And that's why it's often good to make sure you tell each other about encouraging stories of faith you know, in, in your life and things that have happened especially when in your own stories because who else is going to tell them firstly and it's, just, and it's authentic if it's coming from yourself you know, there can be little building blocks for faith along the way that, that we all need to hear so when we're out at morning tea after the service feel free to tell those stories and you know, encourage each other that way because it's really great and that will also help us to glory in God and not ourselves, which is a tricky line to walk sometimes. You know, should I say it? Is it me trying to show off or is it glorifying God? But, you know, if, you, if you're seeking to glorify God, let's, let's do that. Because we do need to remember we are susceptible to pride, all of us, in ourselves. Um, but it's that spirit of hope that's the spirit behind this section of the psalm, I think. He knows he cannot save himself because he's too weak and small and also that there's plenty gather, gathering around him to remind him that he's too weak to save himself um, and those people tend to be oblivious to the same fact in themselves that they can't save themselves but yes this next section is all about being despised by the people so verses 6 and 7 but I'm a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people all who see me mock me they make mouths at me they wag their heads. So the idea behind making mouths, uh, bit there is that they're sneering, pretty much describing the lips. So, like, mm. so I'm sure, yeah, there's a very poor evidence for me. You can imagine your own facial expressions, what they would look like, people sneering at you. But they go on, and now he quotes them, verse 8. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Ha uh ha, -huh, kind of, yeah, that's what you're getting. So I'm sure this happened to David too. But we can know that, that exactly that this happened to Jesus when he was on the cross. And before that too, I'm sure, it happened other times as well. But I'm just going to quote from Matthew 27 when he was on the cross to prove it. So here are verses 39 and then 43. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. 43. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. So that to me is a scarily accurate prediction of what the people said to Jesus, isn't it? Back in Psalm 22. Written a thousand years ahead of time. So hopefully that helps you and I to be able to trust God, doesn't it? That's what it's supposed to do. Because we see that he predicted that accurately. Nothing, um, so we can trust that nothing's going to catch God by surprise. Everything that happens to us, God knows about before it happens and only happens because God says so. 
All of us are born exactly on time and we all die exactly on time. As David also writes, uh, Psalm 139.16 on that point, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And of course, that's true for all of us, not just David. From our conception all the way through, so remember our conception all the way through, not just a birth. God is working out his plan in our physical bodies, so that, you know, this, and that's what the psalm talk, talks about next, actually. So verses 9 to 11. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, and you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. I knew I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. In other words, you've always been there, Lord, protecting and nourishing me, so please don't change what you've been doing. Kind of it's a bit of a similar theme as a couple of verses back, isn't it? Now, especially now my friends have deserted me and everyone else is attacking me. Please. <laughs> and that everyone else now broadens out even further as you get into the third section of the psalm, which we'll call deeper attacks, starting from verse 12. Deeper attacks. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. So he calls them bulls and likens them to lions as well there. So is this just, this just figurative language designed to convey the trouble he feels he's in because he's you know, these big scary animals coming at him? Well, yes, to a degree. But I think there's a reason why he uses that specific imagery. A bit like how we commented at the start that the mention that of a deer conveys certain ideas and certain characteristics and brings with it a certain background. So here I think the, his use of the bull and the lion and a bit later the dog, they all have something behind them to explain their use, I believe. So for the bulls, uh, sure, Bashan was known, it was an area known for its cattle farming, so that's one connection. Today it's the disputed territory of Golan between Israel and Syria. Um, but that's not sufficient to explain why David refers to bulls here, I don't think. Because see how he describes them as opening their mouths at him. Now, that's not something bulls really do. Is that they don't really open their mouths at you. They might, you know, might do a big noise, but it's the lion part is the opening of the mouths. But he's describing bulls as doing that. Now, certainly bulls charge, and they're aggressive. But, yeah, that's, that's about as far as it goes. So perhaps that's the first hint that there's something a little unusual here. And I think the answer lies in recognising the history of this area of Bashan. And as a, a key point that, to realise is that it in, includes the area of Bashan, the very north, the uh, Mount Hermon. And those who have been with us for a while might remember that Mount Hermon was where Jesus' transfiguration took place. So that's the time he appeared in blazing light with Moses and Elijah to just his closest disciples on that mountain. And we concluded that this effectively amounted to a big statement to Satan and his forces that he was taking back, or beginning to, what belonged to him. Because according to tradition and many, and, and many old texts, that mountain was a key meeting place for the powers of darkness. And you have to get to the extra biblical book of Enoch to, um, for all the detail there. But the point is this region of Bashan was also famous as a stronghold for the dark side, if you want to put it that way. So from the evil and possibly giant King Og, Og of Bashan, that's who um, the Israelites kicked out of when they came into the Promised Land, or well, they got rid of him. Through to Jesus' Gates of Hell comment, which was made at the base of Mount Hermon there, the Gates of Hell. So all this stuff points to Bashan being Satan's fortress in a sense. Also, we need to keep in mind that the well-known false god, Baal, or Baal, being a scholar, um, was often depicted as a bull-like creature, as was the possibly related god Molech. And uh, so my point is, it would seem to me that this reference to the bulls of Bashan is most likely highlighting the principalities and powers that were behind the human faces attacking Jesus. So it was, if you're taking the prophetic view of Psalm 22 here. So in his role as prophet... David is able to see into the spiritual realm and see that you know, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Roman authorities and the centurions and all the people who were crucifying Jesus, they're not the real instigators in this injustice against the Son of God. They were certainly complicit in it, 
and they did make their own decisions to be involved and they will be answer answerable for that. But they were effectively acting as puppets for the bulls and lions and other false gods who were seeking to destroy Jesus. And they did succeed in that, didn't they? They killed Jesus. Jesus did die and a horrible and excruci excruciating death it was, which is something the next few verses describe, verses 14 and 15. Don't worry, they, they didn't succeed in the end, did they? But, so, but this is, we're still in the, the death part here, so 14 and 15. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like the potsherd. My, my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. So what's being described here? He's dying there. <laughs> we have someone who's completely empty. Look at some of the characteristics. He has dislocated bones. So think what crucifixion does to your joints, especially, you know, your shoulders. You can do the you know, analysis on it. It's just, it's just so much pressure on your shoulders that it pulls them out. Uh, his heart is giving out, so he's dying. He has no strength left. And he's thirsty. Remember, Jesus said that on the cross, didn't he? I thirst. That's one of the things he said. <coughs> and he dies. He's in the dust of death. That's just from that little bit there. So it sounds like a pretty good description of someone being crucified to me. And this was written centuries again before crucifixion was even invented. But wait for the next verse, verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. Encircles me, yes, right. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now this was just too much for many of the Jewish scholars after Jesus' day. It sounded so much like what Jesus went through that they couldn't allow that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, that's not, it clearly wasn't him because he didn't come and kick out the Romans. So it's not him. So we'll have to do something about what this says here. So they tweaked the Hebrew in one letter so that it said like a lion rather than pierced. So that's why we see the reference to a lion there in many of our modern translations on that, that verse. But it's telling that the Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament into Greek in the 3rd century BC, so before Jesus, before Christ, so before this change was made by those scholars, it uses the word to dig or to gouge there, which certainly more closely fits the idea of piercing, piercing the hands. And there's no hint of reference to a line anywhere. So that's the Septuagint, which is well before so what we have then is a simply even more amazing description of exactly how the Saviour was going to die. In great agony with pierced hands and feet surrounded by human as well as non-human enemies. So here is dogs and, and dogs generally represent the, the phrase I've found was um, unsophisticated servants and may hint perhaps at demons which play that kind of role in the spirit realm, they're unsophisticated servants. Now that's speculative, but it's worth thinking about. Perhaps, perhaps that's what dogs refer to. Anyway, the suffering continues, 17 18. I can count my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So, as many of us know, here's another amazing prophecy, because this is exactly what the soldiers did, right? And John makes, makes the point that this was a fulfillment of this specific prophecy in John 19.24, when he writes this. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. So he's quoting that verse. So <laughs> how many ways do you want this to point to Jesus? You know, this Psalm 22. It's just over and over. And I think we can conclude he's having a pretty bad day, right? This, this, the psalmist, obviously, but pointing to Jesus as having a bad day, humanly speaking anyway. But we need to remember it was actually a great victory and exaltation. The Bible even hints that the lifting on the cross was an exaltation of Jesus. When you understand what was really going on. But before we see that, we have one more cry to God from the suffering psalmist, verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. And 20 and 21. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. There he is again. Save me from the mouth of the lion. So we see more dogs and lions there. And they've got the victory, haven't they? 
They're, they've won. No, actually they haven't. From this point on, the psalm changes completely. And it all pivots around that statement at the end of verse 21. And Glynis read from NIV. It wasn't quite aware that NIV translated that way. It didn't quite fit. But let me explain what's going on there. Uh, the end of verse 21, the phrase is literally, you have answered me. So our ESV translation ties that to the comment about the wild oxen, and so does the NIV. But it would seem better to separate it off as a statement in itself, as it sets the scene for a triumphant ending. So here's a more literal rendering of verse 21. I'll just add it on there. Save me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. So put them together, that's how the Hebrew has it. Then you have answered me as a separate line. So from all those prayers, you have a separate line. He, you have answered me. So the down bit is finished, okay? You know, you've got to go down to go up. The down bit is finished. It is finished. The arrow has been drawn all the way back and now it's shooting up in the opposite direction and he's bringing us with him, which is pretty much how this new section starts, right? It's in his sharing the good news to the gathered faithful. So we'll call this bit the great gathering from um, starting at verse 22. 22 and 23 here. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. And this all fits well with the resurrected Jesus because he first went to the Jews, specifically his immediate disciples and other followers, once he was resurrected anyway. And, uh, he, and he, well, that's who he was working with up to that point. And he went about gathering his followers for their tasks in the church age, which is everyone, Jews and Gentiles. Beyond that, all well, his disciples did. They went to the Gentiles as well. And there's a hint of that in the next bit, verses 24 and 25. For he has not despised nor or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows will perform before those... Sorry, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. So can you see the specific point there of who's part of this kingdom? Who is part of this kingdom? It's not about being Jewish. It's about being one of those who fear him. See that at the end there? That's the issue. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom and faith and everything really. And it's not an issue of genetics, and it's an issue of faith. It always has been, but with the rising of the Messiah now, it's just become more explicit. So let's keep reading and I'll show you. Verse 26 to 28. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will, shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. So all the ends of the earth and all the families of the nations. Guess what? That's you and me. That's everyone. So with Joshua, I'm not sure there are too many other Jewish citizens here today. I'm not sure. But, um, but even if there are, the point is that this includes everyone. To use the themes in verse 26, we're all spiritually well-fed and have eternal life. So we're happy little sheep for the shepherd. <laughs> but there are some goats too. Verse 29 which again I'll take from a more literal translation since the, I think the ESV tends to cloud the issue a little bit here. And just keep in mind that being plump is good in this context. For, sometimes we don't use it that way, but you know, in this context it's good. Healthy sheep, well fed and all that. You know, so All the plump ones in the land eat and will bow down, but each of those going down to the dirt will kneel before his face and will not preserve his soul. So there's a contrast there, two things. So you've got the sheep and the goats, kind of. Those who submit to God and live, those who refuse to kneel at first and die. But as it says that they will bow in the end. Everyone will. Much better to bow now than bow then. So let's keep that in mind, for, but for ourselves and for others. For ourselves in the fact that we need to remember that, you know, taking the broader sweep here, there are only two groups in the end. You submit to God and live or you refuse and die eternally. 
and still submit in the end anyway. So that's the choice before each of us. And the only way to be saved on that day is to place your trust in the only one who has made a way. He is the way, right? Jesus Christ. But also for others in the sense that people need to know that this day is coming, whether they realise it or not. You know, we need to make sure they know. Even if they don't want to hear it, and most people don't want to hear that this day is coming, but they still need to hear it. But the other side of how this applies to others is for those who reject Jesus in the end and decide to attack believers on their way. We need to remember that every knee will bow one day. So even Hitler and Pol Pot and all those guys, they will have their day before the true king. So don't ever feel like evil is one. God's got control of the whole thing and in the end, all wrongs will be made right. But before that day, from David's perspective anyway, there will be many generations to come. We don't know how many generations to come from our day, maybe very few, maybe no more, who knows. You always need to be ready. But it's the coming generations that are the focus at the end of this psalm. So that's 3,000 years ago, so there's been quite a few since then. So we'll call this last bit the generations to come. Verses 30 and 31. Posterity shall serve him, it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. So that sounds a lot like what our job is too, isn't it? Yeah, the news of the cross and the resurrection of our Saviour uh, needs to be taught to the next generation. And keep on getting passed on. That's, we're making a thing about teaching our young people at church and that's, we've got to remember this is very important, passing it on. So what are you doing in your family to ensure this happens? Because this is the great story of history. In fact, it's the point of history. You know, no matter what other things happen, the point of history is for God to bring out mortal people from the world into an eternal relationship with him. So that's the biggest and most important thing to make sure your children understand. You know, the gospel message, basically. That's the rescue plan. So teach them the gospel. Teach them the Bible. Life will be hard. And yes, Satan will throw distractions and difficulties in your way to try and stop that happening. You know, try and set up a regular time with the family and there's always something that comes up. Just keep at it. Stick at it. Because it's the number one thing you can do as a parent, as a shepherd in your family. Because pretty much everyone who's an adult is a shepherd in one form or another. I don't know if you thought about that. And we'll sort of flesh that out through this mini-series within a series. And next week we'll, yeah, we'll get to that famous shepherd psalm, psalm 23 and we'll talk a lot about what shepherding looks like. So there's heaps to learn about shepherding in our own lives from that. Okay, even if you're a, it's a parent's a shepherd, a teacher's a shepherd, a, you know, an uncle can be a shepherd, auntie, whatever. We all have someone we can help along the way. So I hope you can make it next week because it'll be helpful. I hope. <laughs> I'll just end now with a nice little touch. You know how the psalm begins with Jesus' first words on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, have you seen how the psalm ends there? It says, he has done it. It's, it's one Hebrew word, and it can also be reasonably translated, it is finished. Which just happened to be Jesus' last words on the cross, don't they? This is a nice little touch I thought God put in there. It's very good. It's, uh, it works because the it in both cases is the same thing. You know, the atonement for sins is the it in that bit. Now, there is so much more I could say about this amazing chapter, but I'll, uh, I'll save that for the summary message in three weeks' time. So I think it's time to say the same thing David said about this sermon. It is finished. Let's pray.